what I want to do is to, uh, to talk about this next session. And this next session is not a, it's not a panel discussion. Uh, what we we have a number of speakers that will speak to different issues, uh, but they're all around looking at some of the evolving trends, some of the developments that we think are important as we move forward into the diagnosis and treating uh, prostate cancer, managing survivorship. Uh, and uh, so we are highlighting uh, certain of these, uh, certain of these developments. And we, uh, we have a, a great moderator for the session, and it's Dr. Matthew Kanaw. And uh, uh, I looked at Matthew's bio, uh, and I read it in total. And uh, I will say about the bio, if you have just a, a blur, but the full bio's on our website. Uh, but one of the things that jumped out to me about Matt is that I think Matt is one of uh, uh, nine siblings. Where's Matt? Matt is one of nine siblings. He's over there. So y'all look at Matt as I say some of these things about me. He's one of nine siblings, and uh, all of them attended and graduated from Tennessee State University over a 21-year span, earning an aggregate of 14 degrees. And Matt, let's let give Matt a round of applause for that. But, no. No, actually, you know, when, when I look at that, I have three children, and we've sent them through college. Some got advanced degrees. But when I read that, I felt pain and joy for his parents. I know there's joy, but I know there was some pain <laughs> in getting to that joy, man. So uh, I looked at that, and I had to stop <laughs> when I was reading that. But uh, Dr. Kanan is a professor at UDC and a number of his uh, students are here with us today. Uh, and, uh, but in addition, Matt is a member of the Defense Survivor Network, and he's a very active member of the Survivor Network. He works hand in hand with us here in, uh, in the Washington, Maryland area, uh, and uh, he's been to a number of events here, supported events where he's been our uh, representative. He's worked with us in the church community, and so Matt is a uh, is just a tremendous resource and a member of the Fen Survival Network. In addition to being a, a uh, professor at UDC, in addition to bringing joy to his parents as one of those degrees, and so that they can get over all of that pain of putting all of y'all through college. So give him a round of applause for backing up. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I was going to apologize for that uh, dissertation, which I'd have to say it was in terms of my bio. I didn't have time to edit it, so when I was called to send it, I didn't have time to pare it down. But Tom, thanks for embellishing it a little bit for me. First off, I'd like to say uh, this is a wonderful day. Weather is good, we have a good turnout. And I'm pleased to uh, compliment Tom and the panel that preceded us on development and commenting on that consensus statement. I got a chance to peruse it last night, uh, but I didn't read it in its entirety, but I think you're strictly on the right track. And I want to say another thing. I want to say that uh, I have a new respect for Tom, uh, especially since I've been working hand in hand with he and Artie, with the churches in the local area. I have a new respect for Tom, and I think he knows what I'm talking about. Uh, Artie is the, the giant of a fellow that you see running around. <laughs> I, call, I call Artie uh, Tom's first lieutenant, and I'm the second lieutenant, so between the three of us, we, we get the job done. I'd also like to say welcome to this session entitled <clears throat> New Developments and Evolving Trends. 
Now, before I further go any further, I want to say, as Reverend Al would say, friend of foe, we want to know. Is UDC in the house? Yeah. 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 All right. Thank you. That's my class over there. Uh, now I'm going to say this a little quiet. It's First Baptist of North Brentwood in the house. Yay! I, I am. <laughs> I am. <laughs> okay. Now, I'd like to embellish the uh, statement that Tom made too and say that I too am a prostate cancer survivor. Ten years, almost to the day, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer by a gentleman who's going to address this assembly tomorrow afternoon, Dr. Chilidum I'll go to. He's my urologist. And I'd like to say that the consensus statement that was read and dissected certainly underscores my philosophy about the necessity and the approach that Tom is making. Because uh, my first brush with prostate cancer, it was a, I guess it was a false reading to say, a uh, false alarm. And it took another eight or 10 years before I was sent to a different urologist, and that was Dr. Algotu. And when I came back after he had done the biopsy, he said, Doc, I got two things to say. One's good and one's bad. Which one do you want to hear first? I said, it doesn't make any difference. He said, you have it, but it's confined to the gland, and we think we can use a certain procedure to treat it. What I'm trying to say is that the earlier detection of my prostate cancer allowed the uh, treatment team to use a less aggressive form of treatment, and I only missed one day at work. And I have not had a PSA above zero point something since that time. So I think you guys are really on the right track. Now, this session that we're about to begin consists of five excellent discussion topics complemented by five expert presenters. Our first presenter is Dr. Sarah Horton, and I'm going to leave it up to you to peruse the majority of her bio at your leisure, but at least I will state that she earned her MD from Wright State University of Medicine, School of Medicine, apparently, I believe that's in Ohio. And she specializes in hematology and oncology with emphasis on prostate and breast cancer. She is director of clinical trials at the Howard University Cancer Center. And she and I are what I like to call, we're partners in crime. Now, before you guys start going, going the wrong way with that, what I mean by we're partners in crime is that every morning, about 7.30 in the morning, my grandson and her daughter are dropped off at the Howard University <coughs> uh, Early Learning Center. So I say we're partners of crime because we are partners of crime as probably described by the people who run the school. <laughs> anyway, in addition to the other attributes of Dr. Horton, she collaborates with, with Dr. Agu, too, who is the chief of urology at Howard University Hospital, and is my urologist, and he's to appear later on the agenda. Dr. Horton's emphasis today is on the importance of African-American participation in clinical trials. That is a very important topic. So without further ado, Dr. Horton, uh, we will ask you to hold your questions until the end, and each one of the presenters will have approximately 15 minutes. If you can do that. Thank you. Thank you, and good morning. Very warm welcome this morning. Um, 
And so, like you said, I'm a medical oncologist and I'm the director of clinical trials at Howard University's Cancer Center. And today I'd like to speak about clinical trials a little bit and then also the importance of accrual of minorities, specifically African American, on clinical trials and the impact that can have. Um, I apologize, I wasn't sure of my audience, so my slides may seem a little basic to some of you who are familiar with clinical trials. Uh, so I might run through them a little more quickly. We'll need reading glasses soon. <laughs> there we go, let's go back. So um, this is a little bit about cancer clinical trials. This is actually an embellished slide set that the NCI has out just about the basics of clinical trials where I added some more specific slides regarding African Americans. What they are, cancer clinical trials, and why minorities need to be involved. So what are cancer clinical trials? So we know that clinical trials are research studies that take the information that is obtained in the lab, that in uh, laboratories, basic scientists, and it translates that into results that hopefully will give us better treatments to diagnose, treat, and prevent cancers. So why is that important? Well, we all know that cancer is everywhere. It affects us all. We either know someone or personally have been affected by cancer and that those numbers are increasing every year. So we need to get information on cancer to better have our targeted therapies, to better help us increase survival. We know that more than 500,000 people in the U.S. are diagnosed with cancer, um, or are expected to die from cancer every year. That's more than 1,500 people per day. And so every year we have about a million people in the United States diagnosed with cancer. One in four deaths, all deaths are due to cancer. And so, again, our clinical trials are a way for us to get new information into the public to help patients uh, with better treatments. So we know the more people that are involved in clinical trials, the faster we're going to be able to get these new research uh, medications or procedures out to treat people. Unfortunately, we know that um, even though it seems, sounds simple, get everybody diagnosed with cancer, get them in on a clinical trial, we'll get those answers. But the reality is, of course, being involved in a clinical trial is, is something that someone, it's voluntary. They decide if they want to do that or not. So we know that out of all people diagnosed with cancer, only 3% right now participate in clinical trials in the U.S. I'm going to talk a little bit about what clinical trials are, and this is the, the slides that I'll, I'll zip through um, a little faster. Uh, but in general, there are different types of clinical trials. There are treatment trials, which most people are familiar with, where you're actually giving a treatment to help treat the cancer. But there are prevention studies, where we're looking at things that we can do to help prevent cancer and find out which are the best. Early detection trials, looking at our screening, how we found out the colonoscopies, and, PSAs and uh, you know, digital rectal exams all help us in detecting cancers early, mammograms. And then there are times when we know that we may not have an effective treatment or after someone's had treatment, and we do studies to look at how we can make life better for our patients, and those are our quality of life studies. And we study things like acupuncture, and we're involved uh, at Howard in yoga, restorative yoga in patients to help them sleep better after having chemotherapy. So there's all kinds of clinical studies going on. In terms of the different phases, and you may have heard people talk about phase one, two, and three of clinical trials as well. Just in a nutshell, this is a basic, basic um, diagram that explains phase three studies are the most common studies that involve the most patients and ones that we talk about the most where we're comparing the standard of care of treatment, the treatment anybody would get from any doctor, uh, hopefully, to a new drug. And that's after that drug has already been tested in the phase one and phase two levels. So to start out, every new drug goes through, or, or procedure goes through phase one testing. It's a very small number of patients, usually 15 to 30. And that's when you have a drug that looks good in the laboratory. It's been used in animals. It looks safe in animals, and it looks like it's going to be effective against the type of cancer or problem you're treating. And you, you're basically just looking on how that it affects the body and what the right dose is to give. 
Once that's determined that it's safe in a human and we've got a, a dose that looks good, that drug goes on to phase two. Phase two is a little bigger study, it's usually less than 100 people, and everybody gets the drug. And so what we're looking at then is that, how does that drug act against the cancer that we're, we're trying to treat? So everyone in the study would have the, the cancer, and they all look at the drug. And if it looks like the cancer is affected significantly, as good as, or maybe even better than our standard of care, that's when we go to our big phase three studies, which are the big hundreds and thousands of patients where we randomize patients to either get the standard of care drug or the new drug. So this is just a slide on randomization. People hear that term, and again, I think most people may know what that is, but it's just a scientific way of dividing the patients in phase three studies into the ones who are going to get the standard of care drug or the control group, and into the ones who will get the, the, uh, new, the new drug. And it's done blindly to most investigators. Uh, the, the doctors who are doing the study usually don't know which drug is given, it's done electronically, and it's done where we try and make the groups as equal as possible in all other regards so that we get, a very, get an accurate assessment of how that medication is going to do compared to the standard of care. So now I try, I'd like to look a little bit more on African American accrual, and not just African American accrual, but all accrual to clinical trials, which is kind of, I think, the, the um, the problem that we all have to deal with uh, as clinicians and researchers. So I'll go over some myths and facts. First slide is fact slide. So we know that there's a disparity or a difference in the way that cancer affects uh, minorities and underrepresented groups. And we know this because there's been scientific data that's been gathered that shows that African American and medically underserved populations are more likely to be diagnosed with a preventable cancer. That means a cancer that we have screening tests for, okay, that we should be able to detect early and take care of before it causes death. More likely to be diagnosed with a late stage disease for cancers that are detectable, that's saying the same thing. More likely to receive either no treatment for the cancer or less than the standard of care. And also more likely to die of cancers that are curable. So they're more likely to um, die from a cancer that we know that we have good drugs and technology to treat and cure. So because of these disparities, um, we're trying to focus on things that we can change to try and change these numbers. So we've looked at things that I call myths in the community to try to target, to try and encourage people to enroll on studies. So the first myth is clinical trials have nothing to do with me or my medical condition. Well, we all know, again, that any, study, any drug that's prescribed to you by your doctor at some point was tested in a clinical trial. And there were people who courageously decided to enroll in a study to get the drug that you're being prescribed to every day by your doctors and find out that information that it's as, as, as effective as it is. So yesterday's trials are today's treatments. So the results of these studies help us not only in treating the patients, but it gets drugs out there faster. It helps us give more options to patients for treatment. It helps us give drugs that have less side effects and toxicities. This slide just looks at the past 30 years. Oops, I'm sorry. It didn't change. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> sorry. Could you go to the next one, please? So uh, this slide looks at the past 30 years and the effects of um, results of new drugs on the improvement in the survival of patients with cancer. So the top line is all cancers. And so in 1975, if you look at the five-year survival from cancer, is 50%. So half the people, all comers who were diagnosed with cancer, died within five years. If you look at 2005, you see that that number has increased to 68%. That means we've, with all the improvements in drugs and prevention and all, we've been able to increase the survival beyond five years by 18%. And those numbers may sound small, but that's, you have to think about the number of patients that is, that's a huge number of people who are living longer. So when we talk about the disparities of the improvement, 
We, we looked at that 2005 number, that was 68% up from 50% of people who lived more than five years, and we divided into white patients and African American patients. You see that across all sites, most white patients do receive that benefit of actually 19%. And if you look at the African Americans, there's a 10% difference. The benefit from African Americans over the course of 30 years has only been 9%. And so knowing, and, and the rest are, are breakdown of different cancer types and the differences, but knowing that, we know that the only way to know why this is occurring is to get more minorities and African Americans enrolled into studies so we can look at those tumor types and find out is it something, if they're targets or if you know, getting them in the studies may show that they do as well as other patients. But we have to have patients in the studies to find out this information. So again, just talking about the numbers of patients who participate in clinical trials. So of all cancer patients in the US who are diagnosed, 20% are eligible for clinical trials. Not everybody is eligible. There are strict criteria that uh, are becoming more reasonable so that we can include more people, but about a fifth of all cancer patients could be in the study. Of that 20%, 3% actually participate, overall, adults in, in cancer clinical trials. And of that, even a smaller proportion are minority patients. So it's about 1 or 2%. And to have a visual for that, this is from the NCI's uh, publicly funded studies. If you look at the first pile on race, you'll see the majority of participants are white participants and when you look at African Americans, it's about 8%. And so we'd like to enroll more patients from all ethnicities, because if you look at all other ethnicities, it's even smaller, to gather that information to make sure that everybody can benefit from these studies. Okay, second one is that most people don't want to participate in clinical trials. And so we kind of go on that premise that you know, nobody really wants to get involved in, in studies, but in the early 2000s, um, they started to do surveys and gather information on what patients thought about clinical trials. And so it, what was found was that a physician, a primary care physician, the, usual, the physician that the patient usually trusts the most, has the most important impact on whether that patient will say yes to a clinical trial. And when looking at the primary care physicians, only 2% ever mentioned clinical trials as an option to the patient. And most felt that that was going to be the job of the oncologist when this dealt with cancer. And that a large number, over a third, weren't even aware that clinical trials were available for cancer patients. To me, the most discouraging part is that once the patients got to the oncologist, that there were a significant number of oncologists who didn't mention clinical trials to their patients. And so they found that, let's see, 15% of oncologists didn't mention clinical trials to patients who were potentially eligible. And another proportion felt that minority patients um, were less likely to want to participate. So we're going in already with kind of predetermined judgments about clinical trials that we need to, to change. So it's not only at the patient level, but it's at the physician level. So, you know, a commonly held belief in regards to minorities is that many believe that minorities aren't interested in participating. And a meta-analysis was performed in 2005 or six, again, taking surveys that found that the majority of minority patients are willing to participate if asked. And they felt that it was found that we're, they were less likely to be invited or asked to participate in studies. So we've got some inherent changes that we need to make in terms of getting patients on trials. Third myth is that clinical trials are only for people who have run out of other options, nothing else left to give them. So again, this is our phase study. We know that phase ones, the smallest group, that's experimental stage. That's for, when, you know, usually that's when you have a patient who doesn't have any other options. The majority of patients go on to the phase three studies, which is when we have an option, we have a standard of care, we're just looking for the next best thing. Myth four is the patients think they're going to be a guinea pig, they don't want to be experimented on. And, and that comes from some, some deep-rooted deep -rooted, uh, 
ideas that come from truly unethical studies that were done in the past. So we know that there were abuses in the past. We all know about the Tuskegee Civil Study, uh, the German concentration camps. We know that there was a little work institution where, where mentally challenged children were used in unethical clinical studies. And there also was the Jewish Product Disease Hospital in New York where they were using older patients in studies. And all of these things led to changes, federally regulated changes to help participants be protected when they're on studies. So that's, um, we'll go through two. So the, the federal regulations require that anyone having a study must discuss the benefits, the risks, and why the study is being performed in detail with the patient before they agree. So there are, in general, four things. There's informed consent that we have in place, which again is a paper that describes the study. It tells the risks and benefits. It's reviewed by the doctor with the patient, as well as the patient allowed to take it home and review it with their family or their doctors to sign before they're ever enrolled. It also states that at any time, they can leave that study for any reason. There's scientific review, uh, there are institutional re review boards, which every institution performing clinical trial has a board of people from that institution who are dedicated to protecting their rights and they review all studies, not once, but periodically updating to make sure that there's no um, adverse reactions that are significant um, there's the data safety and, mon safety and monitoring boards that are put in place, usually by the people who are performing the study, but the boards are usually outside organizations who periodically review that study to make sure it's safe for the public, and they'll stop the study if it's not safe. Um, one last myth that we hear a lot about is the use of placebos, and I just wanted to mention that the majority of clinical trials do not use placebos. The only time a placebo or kind of sugar pills or you know, not real treatment is used is when the standard of care is not to use treatment at that time and you're comparing a new drug to the standard of care. In that case, you may have one arm, which is a placebo, but that it also is explained to the patients in detail uh, before they agree to that study. So there are risks for participation. Risks are that this new treatment may not be as good as the old treatment, but again, as going through the phase one and two, there's a lot of data going into those studies to back the fact that we think that this drug is going to be as good. We know it's safe, but there may be some adverse reactions that we find going along through the studies too that weren't known before. Um, we know that even though it may, the drug may work in some patients, it may not work in all patients. And then um, the last is that not all healthcare and insurances, insurances will pay for clinical trials, and a financial assessment is done before any patient is enrolled on a study to see if they will be responsible, but most institutions have monies in place to cover those, so it should not be any extra out-of-pocket cost. The benefits are that if the patient receives a drug and it's successful, they have been one of the first people to receive this new drug, which everyone will be wanting to get, that will become the new standard of care. Patients are closely monitored, and that's nice. Patients like to know that someone's watching them, watching their disease process, making sure that they're okay. Um, patients have a chance to help out others. There's definitely um, that aspect of being able to help those who are coming after you, finding out new and better treatments. So why do so, so few cancer patients participate? Well, we know that some patients don't know about clinical trials, thus our push to try and get information out about we're here, clinical trials are available, even though the doctors might not mention it, it may be up to the patient to say, hey doc, is there a study for me? Some people don't act, have access to studies. Studies are not done at every institution. So we're working, and I'll talk a little bit about how in DC we're working to try and make sure that every institution, if they don't know, they have an easy way to find out and get in touch with institutions that are performing clinical trials. Some people are afraid or suspicious of research. Um, some patients think that they can't afford to participate. And again, this is discussed with the patient that it shouldn't be an out-of-pocket cost. And some may not want to go against their physician's wishes, so we're actually going to push to educate primary care physicians again about the importance of clinical trials. So this is one of my last slides where I just put NCI because everyone knows NCI and it's, it's a great general resource. Even though I'm at Howard University Cancer Center, I think that NCI has done a good job of describing a lot of things that have to do with cancer and clinical trials in a way that people can understand. 
So their website is cancer.gov. Uh, clinicaltrials.gov, which is very easy to remember, lists just about every clinical trial that's out there. It is a great resource for physicians and patients to find studies. And the 1-800-4-CANCER number. Um, I'd like to just mention three very quick things because I know I'm getting towards the end of my time. One is um, near and dear to my heart. Two, two actually are, is um, how University Cancer Center's outreach for prostate cancer. And we've um, been performing free uh, PSAs and digital rectal exam on men for over 10 years in a program called Men Take 10, which is once a month at Howard. And we've screened many, many men. And um, I think that we have, um, Howard has a lot of outreach programs that people don't know about. And I don't, for whatever reason, um, we need to make sure that people know that it is a resource for that type of thing. Also, we have a mobile prostate van now. Uh, Howard received a grant so that we can go out to the community to do screening exams. The second thing that's near and dear to me is a group that one of our speakers um, after me, Dr. Janet Paul, is part of as well, is a, a group that's a consortium of the area of genital urinary, which is GU, or prostate, or kidney, bladder cancer, physicians who have um, come together and meet on a quarterly basis to discuss clinical trials in this area so that we all are aware of the clinical trials that are being performed. We are um, the group which was started by an uh, oncologist at Georgetown who just kind of reached out to doctors at Hopkins and Howard and NIH and the University of Maryland and Walter Reed and some private groups. And we come together and have developed a website, which I think Chan gets a lot to do with, but lists all the GU clinical trials in this area and region, who to get in contact with, and um, any other information you need to, to know, just to make it easier for, at least in the DC, Maryland, and Virginia area, our patients to have access to studies. The very last thing I want to say is in regards to the consensus, consensus statement that was discussed here from Fenn. Um, as I was talking to uh, Dr. Fair, uh, Dr. Kennard and Farrington about, as a medical oncologist, how I feel, um, the consideration of African-American men into a high-risk group is something that has always um, been the way that I looked at African-American men with prostate cancer. And so even though the consensus statement, uh, even though the media has picked up on changes from the task force in regards to decreasing the age, or increasing the age, or not even doing PSA applications. I feel that it strongly, um, it, I strongly support continuing PSAs on 40-year-old men who are African-American. I think a lot of medical oncologists do as well. So I hope that this consensus statement is, is available to people in the media so that the community can understand that as well. So thank you for listening today.